Welcome back everybody to Let's Get Serious. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a name, finally. It took us a while, but a name happened. And just like everything in my life, I, we let it happen organically. And we like organic. My name is Jack Wallen and I'm here with... Swapnil Bhartia. And today we're going to talk about, we're gonna continue talking about Linux, like we talked about in the pilot episode, because we still had a lot to talk about. We came up with something that we think everybody out there We'll want to discuss. The topic just today you, you, is... You, yes. you just introduced your name of the show and that's when my network went down. So you said it's called Let's Get Serious. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> what, 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 what does that mean? Well, I think to me, and I, I believe you feel the same way, that it means that we're going to have serious discussions about topics. And they're going to be talk topics that we feel passionate about. And I, th I think they're going to be serious and adult conversations that need to happen on these topics. Right, right. And when you say that topics, uh, is it all going to be about Linux or it will touch uh, technology or it will go to uh, science like Elon Musk is doing a lot of things or it will right. just restrict to Linux? Well, I think <laughs> what's interesting about this is that Swapnil and I are, are both writers, we're both fiction writers. Well, we're both fiction writers and tech journalists. So trying to limit it, the, limit the two of us to just technology is kind of challenging. <clears throat> so I think that we're going. To, this is going to cover a myriad topics. We'll cover sci we'll cover science fiction. We'll cover fiction in general. We'll cover possibly movies and television. Maybe music. Maybe politics. The world is our oyster, and we are going to not eat it because I'm a vegan, so I don't eat oysters. But <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So, and today, as you said, we are going to talk about uh, the State of Union of Linux. Yes, what we want to talk about today, and, and this, something kind of hit me the other day. Uh, we had talked about Linux as a platform. And I think that there's a lot to be mined in that topic. And I was, I was well, quite frankly, well, I, I was getting finished with my exercising and I was in the shower cleaning up. And a lot of ideas always come to me in the shower. I don't know why. They also come to me while, while I'm exercising. I think there's science behind that. But there is the idea, the idea of Linux as a platform versus Linux as a collection of apps. I think that, and you mentioned this last week, I think that is one of the ideas holding Linux desktop back. And we kind of touched on it. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot more to say about that. And let me, let me, inter let me just, I'll just dive into what this idea that I came up with. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about Linux as a platform. And, and I know that last week I mentioned System76 and their Pop! OS and what they're trying to do there. And I think that they, they could very easily do something similar to what Mac has, to what Apple has done with the Mac. They have everything in-house, they have their hardware, they have their software in-house. And they, they develop and build and design their software around their hardware so that they know that when they ship a laptop, a desktop, a server, everything works. That the end user doesn't have to then log in to their new piece of hardware and then all of a sudden have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get things working. I mean, just think about it. You get a, a laptop from, from a company and whether it's got pre-installed Linux or not, then you have to go through the hoops of, of installing the codecs for multimedia because of a licensing issue. Or there are, um, uh, you have to install Java for the, get the full effect of LibreOffice. There's all these sorts of things you have to do. Now, System76 is in a position where they could take care of all of that ship you your laptop, you log in, everything works. But now, now, the problem with that is, and we all know, now, I'm a big fan of System76. I use their hardware. I, I have reviewed their hardware. I've, I have interacted with the company. I think they're doing a great thing. But they're small. They're not only small, but if you look at their price, their price point, it's a little high. Now, some, a lot of their, some of their hardware is worth it. Like I have a Leopard Extreme desktop and it's worth it. It was worth every penny I paid for it. But the average user doesn't want to pay $1,000 for a laptop unless they're getting a Mac, right? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Now imagine this. We all know that the great Google proved that platform kind of doesn't matter anymore. You can get a Chromebook and you can log into your Chromebook and you can do just about anything you need to do, the average user. Now, if we're talking average user. We're not talking about a gamer. We're not talking necessarily about a developer. We're talking about the average user who does what? What do you think the average user does? Right. I mean, I, I fully agree, yeah. They, they get on a browser. My, my, <laughs> yeah, my, my wife is a full-time Chrome. She used to be Mac OS, OS user, then I moved her to Ubuntu, and then I moved her to Chrome OS. And this is funny, that when she was on Mac OS, uh, I was her support, uh, you know, <laughs> she'll file tickets, you know, that this is not working, that was not working. Uh, of course, on Ubuntu, uh, uh, it went higher a bit because, you know, she would not be able to use uh, sometimes the docs that were sent to her from the friends of Fule and, of course, some of the pictures and all those issues. Of course, Netflix was not back there. But ever since I moved her to Chromebook, I mean, we don't talk at all right. now for the support. <laughs> right. Because, you know, everything works the way it should work. Right. And you're right. You know, most people... Uh, live in a browser. I mean, if you look at us, other than, you know, uh, as you mentioned last time that, you know, the first draft, mostly you do it on a Google Drive, you know, yeah. or Google Docs. Yeah. And then, you know, when we share with external, then we use it. Uh, my only difference is that I do a lot of film production work and that's where I need a system that right. can handle that kind right. of workload. Right. Right. Other than that, I mean, if you look at my own work, it's all on, in a browser. Right. It's, it, but the only difference is that uh, when I look at my toolbox, you know, mostly that is the, the Philip screwdriver, that is the most used one. But then there are two which had different bits that I need, you know, at least once a month or at least twice a month. And if I don't have that one, I will not get the, like, for example, I have RC car. I have to open it every now and then, and I need that screwdriver. Right. So I do know that in my toolkit, when I need it, it is there. So similarly, sometimes when I look at a platform, but most people are happy with the Philips, you know, had a school school driver. Right, right. They're fine with right. that. Yeah, yeah. I, my wife's the same way. She was yeah. she was using a Mac, and it was it, actually it was the same progression. She used a Mac, then she used Ubuntu, and now she uses a Chromebook. And the only thing I ever have to do is if something goes wrong with my printer, I have to reshare the printer out to her so she can she, right. she can use it. But now, here's here's where it gets interesting for me. So what Google has done is they've proved that you can just use that Chrome OS and they can then they can then mm. ship that Chrome OS on inexpensive hardware so you can buy a de I bought my wife a decent Chromebook of actually a really nice Chromebook for five hundred dollars that was a really nice one you can get an average one for yeah. two three hundred dollars okay yeah I got a flip one which was even cheaper and it has it can turn into a tablet right right now I have a Chromebook pixel which was pretty expensive but it's really quite nice now, mm -hmm. we all know, well, some of those of us that write about technology knows that Google uses Linux on the desktop in-house. They have this, they used to use, um, what was it called, Goo, I think. And then they recently migrated, and I think they, they went from a Ubuntu-based distribution to a Debian-based mm -hmm. distribution. And so they have this in-house operating system that they use on a lot of their desktops. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And they won't let that. They won't let anybody see that. I can't get that distribution. You can't get that distribution. It's it's in house, and that's that's it. Now imagine this. Imagine if Google decided to. They finally said, "Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take our in house operating system, our in house Linux based operating system, and we're going to install it on inexpensive hardware, and we're going to sell it." So, what would happen? is we would know that everything in that desktop operating system would work exactly as we needed it. And it would be shipped on inexpensive hardware. So you, you could go to, to Google Play Store and you could, you could go to their laptop section and you could pick either a, a Chromebook with Chrome OS or you could, we could call them Linux books or Lin books, whatever you want to call them, or you could buy that. So you would know that you're getting either a Chromebook with complete and utter, utter simplicity or you're going to get a Linux-based Chromebook that has a bit more power and a bit more flexibility. And because Google is in take, Google, this is all in-house, and Google has has control of everything. They would know that when they ship these out, 
those Linux machines would work exactly as the Chrome OS machines would work. The only difference is, is it would have uh, um, multitasking, true multitasking, and you could install LibreOffice and GIMP and whatever you needed on it. And, and they would set it up so that it would be, it would be user-proof, so that you would never have to use the command line, which you don't anyway. But they would effectively create a Linux platform, a Google Linux platform, that's guaranteed to work. And they could integrate it seamlessly with, with Google Drive. So there would, you would not have, well, they would, of course, then have to create a, a native uh, a Google Drive client, but they could integrate it seamlessly with Google Drive so that you wouldn't have to worry about that. And you would have all the power of Linux. So you would effectively have a, a more standard desktop operating system controlled by Google, powered by Linux. And you right. would get it all in the mm. realm of two, three, maybe four, five hundred dollars. Right. And what is the target audience of this uh, platform? I think I think the target audience would be standard users who are looking for a, a little bit more than what Chrome OS offers, because there are there are some users there. There are some people out there that they willingly buy a Chromebook, thinking that it's right. going to be exactly what they need, and then very quickly exactly. they realize they're a little bit limited by the Chromebook. Yes. Or developers, I, I remember, because yeah, if, if a yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember I was at a Linux con and uh, SJVN, you know, a very good friend SJVN was there, and uh, we were at a keynote, and for some reason his dictaphone didn't work, so I recorded my Zoom, and I was, uh, I said, oh, you can have my copy, so I said, oh, I record everything in Wave, you know, uh, raw. Uh, he said, oh, Chromebook cannot handle it, so can you? So I compressed it and then gave it to, that's why I, I mean, I have a Chromebook, but I bring my Mac everywhere uh, so that I have able, uh, you had two points here and that's where, you know, I see the big differences. One is that when people buy Chromebook, they very well know what they're getting. They are, they know very well that, you know, this is a browser. Yeah. So their expectations are all, you know, already, you know, at that, I mean, I won't say that they have lowered their expectation, but I say that they are very clear about what they should expect from this device. They know that you know it will not run a lot of Windows applications because it's just a browser. It's yeah. just Chrome. You know you cannot run Windows application in Chrome. The problem uh, uh, when you go beyond that, and that is what I was uh, thinking about when Microsoft is working on um, an ARM version mm -hmm. of Windows or you know the, the 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 Net platform. It will not run a lot of traditional Windows applications. No. The big problem is that the moment you think about desktop platform, whether it's Mac or so the Mac people already know very well that they, it will not run Windows application. They know very well. I mean, that's what the thing is. The messaging, the marketing from the very beginning is clear that it's a train, it does not fly. It's a plane, it doesn't, you know, uh, go in the water. Right. So they were, so the problem with the Linux, whenever you, we try to push it, is, is what happens is, and that's what most of the time people get disappointed in Linux desktop is that, uh, like even with the, with the Pop OS or, you know, whatever efforts that System76 is putting in that, and most of the times it is promoted as a general purpose platform. And the general purpose platform is a huge thing. The re, like for example, once again, I will repeat, uh, right now, I'm recording my video through the Tethering app, which is connected to my computer from my GH5S uh, camera. The app is not on Linux. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I just got this new camera, which was announced last month, and uh, the raw format that it shoots in is not supported on Linux. GIMP cannot open it. Right. DigiCam cannot open it. Darktable can even Windows cannot open it. Right. Okay. So the thing is that. If you promote your platform as a general purpose platform, and then I will try to uh, run general purpose workloads on it, and if it, it will not work, right. I will get disappointed. Right. So, so uh, my big question is that when you say that some people want just a bit more than Linux, oh, sorry, more than Chrome, or Chrome OS, whatever it offers, my thing is that, you know, from the current limitation of Chrome OS to everything else, it's too much. Right. So I think Google will fall into the trap of trying to cater to everybody and then it will be a failed platform. Right. That's my opinion because then people say, you know what, oh, don't get Chromebook because it's kind of, but you know what, get, get this Linux book, you know, because you can do a lot more. They'll buy a Linux book. Hey, I cannot run Microsoft Office. Right. I can run on Photoshop. Right. I have spent $1,600 on this laptop and I cannot, like when I look at Pixel, Actually, I, I, as much as I'm a fan of Google uh, Pixel, I did not buy Pixel because for $1,600 I can get a MacBook. Right. 
which will run everything that I need. I don't need touch a screen, you know, honestly speaking. Sure. For that interface, I don't do much. Sure. So, so what do you think about that? You know, that if they do offer something, won't they be uh, kind of, you know, uh, increasing or raising people's expectation? And then, of course, that platform will not be able to meet people's expectations. Well, I think the first thing that Google would have to do is, well, first and foremost, we have this, we have this kind of disconnect between, I think, manufacturers and developers, designers and users as to what is the average user. And you ask different people and you're going to get a different answer. Right. And the, the truth of the matter is, if you look at the global, uh, the global numbers, the average user is really turning into a mobile user now. Mm -hmm. Because the Android mobile platform is one of the most widely used platforms in the world. And um, I, I think that you have to figure out what it is that people use their devices for. And, you know, and there was this big fear that de the desktop computer was dead. Well, the desktop computer is never going to die. No, never. Because there's too much that, too many sectors in the world and business and, and, and home that depend upon the desktop computer. And by desktop, I mean desktop or laptop. I mean just the standard configuration. I, 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 actually, it's not just the people who depend on it. You know, when you talk about the death of desktop, what is going to replace it? Okay, I see at mobile, mm -hmm. tablets have kind of died off because iPad sales are down. I mean, I have an app tablet. I don't have to buy it every year. So once right. I do, actually, I do upgrade every time a new tablet comes out. Uh, but tablet and mobile phone. And then uh, since I'm heavily into, as a science fiction writer, I'm into VR. You know, I have three VR platforms at home. Right. Uh, the only reason I did not get the full-fledged Oculus Rift because it runs on Windows and somehow I am not comfortable with Windows. So I have Samsung Gear, I have you know Google Daydream, and I have Sony PlayStation VR. Right. Uh, uh, so, so if you look at it, it's, it's mobile, it's going to be augmented reality, it's going to be virtual reality. So people say, you know what, we don't need desktop. Okay, I agree. But how are you going to develop content for that platform? Right, right. Yeah. You need, you need, a, you need a platform. The, the more, uh, uh, you're not going to develop, you know, uh, an app for Android or iOS on an iPhone. You're not going, going to, actually what is going to happen is that while the PC sales will decline in the consumer space, it is going to become a niche. And uh, uh, I, I, I feel that... Uh, uh, just the way in old days, you know, you ha used to have a specific platform like appliances. So it will become a desktop will become a very expensive platform. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, since the the the, uh, the economy of sales has gone down, the people are not buying desktop for millions of millions of dollars. So right. you know, they w they won't be able to offer RAMs and GPUs for cheap. Right. And at the same time, people when they are developing, like for example, just look at this system that I'm using right now to edit my 4K. I had to buy a graphic card which is seven hundred dollars. Sure. You know, so sure. the whole system uh, would cost me ten thousand dollars if I want to be able to edit four K. I'm not even talking about editing, you know, VR content. Right. So desktop will become very expensive, yeah. and desktop will become niche. Now that's where I feel. So first of all, desktop will not die, but that's where I feel that there is a huge opportunity for Linux because now you have a very specific use case: the creators, right? The makers who are using their desktop to create these kind of works, you know, VR content or, you know, a AR content, augmented reality by that right. I mean. Now what, so now what is happening is that when you sell a desktop, you're not worried about uh, somebody wanting to use a Microsoft Office or Photoshop. You know that, okay, this guy is, buy he's a filmmaker, he's buying the desktop to edit his films in VR. Right. Now your market is small, your device, uh, hardware is expensive and with Linux, you get the flexibility at kernel level to optimize things. You know, right. you can you can optimize audio to, to I mean, like in right now in Linux, Jack and everything is there, but it's mess, okay? Right. Most of the time Linux is used, you know, like if you look at Pixar, they open source their 3D rendering software. They were using Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux on System76 system when they did the demo. Right. They all use, you know, for rendering everything they use, but and uh, and most of the they have they have moved to Linux, but that's in the higher end film editing, you know, not right. because they need access to kernel level. So they write their own application, they write their own platforms. Right. So I think that's actually going to create a huge opportunity for Linux people to to target those users, and you know, and, and then you know, Mac OS or Windows will not have any 
just like uh, your your uh, uh, supercomputers, uh, Linux, uh, sorry, Mac OS and Windows has no market. Same will happen in that space right. because Linux will be able to offer everything, right. every tuning that you need at the kernel level. Right. And but the, but at the same time, I think what's important that has to happen is that we have we have all of these. Let me if you, if you look at the the Linux app stores, the you know the the GNOME software or Synaptic or whatever, there are thousands upon thousands of pieces of software in there. And the problem is with those, with many of those titles is that number one, some of them don't work. Okay, or some can I interrupt you for a second? Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Yeah. So, so right now what I mentioned was I was talking about very, very, you know, specific use cases. Now uh, what you're talking about a general purpose computing, right? right, right. So yeah, let's, 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 let, so that was one use case which was in you know, a very specific use case. So now let's talk, So and that's where we think that Linux has huge potential to succeed. Right. They can own the market. Oh, sure. The second, and, yeah, and, the and second part of the market, the second part of the market is the consumer market. That, let's, yeah, let's talk about, because you, you right. uh, uh, how they can uh, make some difference there. Right, well, you know, there, there's this huge, there's a huge disconnect between the enterprise market and the user market. The enterprise market yeah. wouldn't succeed at all these days without Linux. They, the enterprise market depends upon Linux. And yeah. because Linux, the thing about it is, is that Linux powers so much now. Facebook, uh, eBay, Google, Twitter. I don't think you should say, it, it, uh, you should not name what is powered by Linux. You will, you will have to find which is not powered by right, Linux. Right, exactly, almost exactly. Every... <laughs> and, 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 the, yeah. and the thing is, is that it, it's, there, it's, it's almost, this, this strange dichotomy here where you have all these enterprises that absolutely depend upon Linux, but they aren't allowing that to trickle down to the users outside of the experience like Facebook and Twitter and all that. And so, and I, and I realize that, I understand. Like Facebook has, they have a market and that's their market and their market is social media and everything they do is geared towards that. And then you have, uh, like Pixar, you have Pixar who does, they, they have, they have server farm, they're rendering farms that are a bunch of Linux machines, huge clusters of Linux machines. And then when you get, the problem is when you get down to the end user, it's hard, it's hard to define what end users are doing, you know, and, and I think that that is a big part of the problem is, and I think that part of it is, is that manufacturers don't even know what users are doing. And I, I think, right. I think it's very simple to distill, to distill everything down to a small selection of tasks that end users do. They do social media, they do online banking, they shop. And if you keep listing them off, most of the things that end users do are done within a browser. And if that's the case, then platform does not matter. The only thing that matters is that every browser functions as the user expects. And even that's a problem. Like for example, uh, my wife is a, uh, a cosmetologist and here in Louisville, Kentucky, when she goes to renew her license, the, the hair and lic the licensing board, their website cannot be used on any browser but Internet Explorer. It can't wow. be used on Edge, it can't be used on Chrome, it can't be used on Firefox, it can't be used on Safari, it can't be used on any mobile platform. It, it can only be used on Internet Explorer. Oh my goodness. And that and what, is, what, that's just lazy co coding. That's just a lazy, a group that hasn't yeah. hired a coder or a group of coders that can redesign, and their website's old. You go to it and it looks like it was designed on an old, you know, spark box or something. But um, I don't know what, what else supports IE because I think if, if your machine supports IE, so I think there are only two things running on your machine. One is IE, second is a lot of viruses. Right. Right. Because it's not, anything that runs on, runs can run IE is not even supported anymore. Right, I know. And but but you have but the thing is is there are that's not isolated. There are other instances where there are websites that that don't function the same on different browsers. And I think that it's I think that at this point in time it's become a necessity that all browsers function exactly as the users expect them to. Because yes. I mean, you, you, we we've and, and the Linux community has experienced this since the mid '90s. Fragmentation. You know, we how many dis distributions are there? There are thousands of distributions. There are. I mean, think about it. Like, 
like um, my fa my desktop OS of choice is Elementary OS, and Elementary OS out of the box uses the Mirador browser. I don't or know. Midori yeah, I mean, browser. Look at, it's like uh, GNOME has their own browser. KDE yeah. on Plasma has their own browser. Why? I mean, you cannot even settle down on one uh, browser. I know. And, and and all of these cannot even render eighty percent of the stuff that is on the internet. Right. You know, and and even even Firefox prior to Firefox Quantum, Firefox had all sorts of problems. It was incredibly I, bloated. Yeah. It, it, I, it was... I was just uh, on Chrome all the time. I could not use Firefox at all. Yeah. Well, I I used I used Chrome for years, and I only yes. recently switched to Firefox Quantum because. Um, it, it, it had some features that I liked um, right. over Chrome, but even still, there are things I need to do. I need to go back, like mm -hmm. there's a CMS that I use that doesn't mm -hmm. function perfectly on, on Firefox. So there's okay. fragmentation within the browsers. I think until, until all that fragmentation ends, there's always going to be this problem. And, I, and I, just talking about Firefox, I remember uh, SJVN wrote a story recently where he uh, ran some uh, benchmarking test on Firefox, Edge, and Chrome. All oh, right. And he found and he found that the Firefox was the slowest among the three uh, plat, you know, uh, browsers. Yeah. And you would expect that Firefox would be faster, but it was not. So. Yeah. Uh, well, and and then you look at it, and that's that's the other thing. You look at other benchmark, even even the benchmark tests that are used <laughs> aren't aren't unified. So yes. you know, and and it's it's become. You can look at you can look at Microsoft Office, the fo the files that Microsoft Office generates, and then you open them up in in LibreOffice, and they're not the same. And I understand there's issue with with fonts and font renderings, but that fonts and font renderings aside, I should be able to. And and I'm speaking in it as a user because I understand some of the difficulties. But as a user, I should be able to open up. A file that was someone created in Microsoft Office, I should be able to open up on my Office suite of choice, and there should be no problems. Right. But unfortunately, there is. And that's because, and I, I think it's common knowledge, that Microsoft has always been really bad about following standards. <laughs> they never needed to. They dominated the market. Right, exactly. They were setting exactly. standards. So, <laughs> and, and I, I, I think at that one they're... point of time, they, sorry, uh, oh, I just, at one point of time, they actually used these standards to maintain their dominance. It's only now when things have changed, where, you know, in, especially in the enterprise space and the mobile space. But I, when I say enterprise, I don't mean enterprise like, you know, where you still have PCs. Mobile and, you know, uh, market, uh, Microsoft is no more a dominant player. So they have to now follow other players. And they're actually, to be honest with you, they are doing a very nice job. Actually, I, I, a lot of people uh, give Microsoft bad name, but it is always, there, there are three tiers of management in any company, the top tier, the middle level managers, and then the developers. Developers are always pro-open source, you know, because they would like to see the code, they want to fix the problems, that's it. Middle level people are the problem sometimes because they have to deliver the results and they have to get their, you know, bonuses. The <laughs> top tier is like when it was Steve Ballmer, you know, then, you know, they have their own mindset. Like I remember at Tesla also when Elon Musk was there, he was, he was totally against Linux. He was a Mac and Windows person. But after he exposed himself, then, you know, he became kind of, you know, a Linux guy. So, so there are three tiers. So uh, I was tracking Microsoft open source. They had been doing open source for a very long time. Right. I met Sam Ramji, who was, uh, you know, CEO of uh, Cloud Foundry. Now he's at Google. He, they had an internal project in Microsoft where they were doing a lot of open source work and sharing it. Uh, so I, I just want to, you know, be fair to them also sure. that they are doing a lot of open source. Uh, uh, just like, you know, if you look at United States, you know, okay, our government sucks, you know, the president, uh, I don't know what, but that doesn't mean every American is like that, you right. know, so please, if you're not in, uh, living in America, if you're living in Germany abroad, please don't think of us, you know, so uh, just to make it clear from Microsoft's sure. point of view. So, but they still, you know, even if their developers are pro open source, there are still some divisions within Microsoft that may still use, you know, uh, interoperability or those things in the consumer space, in the enterprise space, they don't have any say. They have to play nice, yeah. you know. Yeah. But they're still, you know, playing that game, and uh, it could be a deliberate game, or it could be just, you know, it's, you know, since they have been doing it for so long. I mean, Microsoft was in like '76, you know, or '77, so it's like you know they're totally, you know, uh, um, old company, so they still have those traits there, uh, but. Let, let, let's think about it from positive point of view, okay? Yeah. What should Linux do? We know the problems, we know the challenges, 
and and uh, Linux is almost 27 years old now. You know, uh, uh, SUSE was created in 1992. Red Hat was created in 1993. You know, and KDE and GNOME communities has been there for all that long. And what we have been doing is that we are, we we, are, we seem to be not learning anything. We are keep doing the same mistake and thinking that for some reason we will get different results by doing the same thing over and over again. Right. Well, so I, I... so so let's let's think about let's break it down in few points that you know a, a desktop person needs and what Linux should do to actually change the situation by doing something different, not by doing the same thing uh, by creating a new app store or by creating you know. Um, something new again, which was done two, three years ago. What's your opinion about that? Well, I, th I think that, and this this may sound a little crazy, but it's almost like Linux needs to come, come to this conclusion where there's a governing body over Linux. And that governing body, you know, and, and we do have this, the Linux standards base. It's Linux to mm -hmm. LSB, Linux standards base. And I, I think that, I, I think that at one time, Linux standards base was really important because Linux was facing an uphill battle from every angle. And mm -hmm. I think it's, but I think we've reached a point now where we have all of these different distributions that are all very good. But the problem is, is they're, they're not unified. And I'm not talking about that they all have to use the same package manager, they have to, you know, they all have to use the same desktop. I'm saying that there needs to be a set of standards that all Linux developers need to follow. And that, and that could go all the way to what's the default browser that you ship with. And, and, that, and, and everybody knows in the Linux community that it doesn't matter what default is shipped, that you can install whatever you want. But for the sake of the end user, there needs to be a little bit more conformity to, to a standard. And I, I, th I think that... Um, that that standard we could have standards for a lightweight version then we can have a standard for the desktop version and a standard for the server version and i i think that it needs to you know it, it sort of limit the possibility i'm not we'll never limit the full possibility and capability of linux but limit the possi the, the, the the possibilities for the end user say for example um just just today, I was dealing with this. I, I installed um, an, a, a desktop operating system and noticed, and this was a rolling release distribution, and immediately I noticed there, there were four different versions of this rolling release distribution. There was GNOME, KDE, LX, FC, and I can't remember the other one. Yeah, if you can't remember that, that explains very well. Right. That how right. <laughs> but now here's where the confusion gets. Okay, so I installed the um, the uh, LXFC version and the GNOME version. The GNOME version shipped with LibreOffice. The LXFC did not. The GNOME okay. version with L with LibreOffice had version had the the the, the still version, the 5.4 version. This is a rolling release distribution that's supposed to have the most updated software. Everything on the desktop is supposed to be the most updated version. But LibreOffice was out of date. And it gets worse. Now, I, I preface this by saying it was a really good distribution, but it gets worse. On the GNOME version, it had GNOME software, and then it had, uh, I can't even, I don't know how to pronounce it, PAMAC, P-A-M-A-C, the, the Pac-Man uh, GUI interface. So you had two software app, app stores on one distribution. Now, if I went into Pamac, Pac-Man interface, I could install either I could install either LibreOffice still or LibreOffice fresh. Then if I go to GNOME software, there was only one version of LibreOffice in there. So, if a new user were to open the, to to install this desktop and then and then go, "Oh, I'm good." It doesn't have LibreOffice. I need to install LibreOffice. And they go to open, install it, and there's two different versions. Which do I use? And then if, if you open up the GNOME version and you say, oh, this is a rolling release. It should have the newest version. Oh, wait. This is version 5. It's out of date. And, and it's, rolling re it's rolling release. Yeah. It's supposed to have the newest releases, and it didn't. So there's, there's, there is a lack of unity in Linux. Now I should I should preface this by saying Linux has been I, I I've used Linux since the late nineties. And and so I have I have experienced all the problems 
and all the battles. You know, I remember the VI versus Emacs wars. And, and I, I think that those days of those kind of wars need to be done with. And we need to come to some sort of conclusion that, I mean, and let's take this to an extreme. We need to come to some sort of conclusion that for new users, the GNOME desktop is the desktop of choice. So let's, let's promote the GNOME desktop. Or maybe it's not, maybe it's KDE. Who knows? But there needs to, I think there needs to be this decision made that there's these standards. And if your distribution wants to follow these standards, this is what you need to do. That doesn't mean you have to have a distribution with the um, apt or, or, or yum. It just means that your distribution on the surface, on the, the user, end user facing surface, it needs to do this. Right. Actually, uh, it's interesting because few weeks ago, I created a YouTube video where I said that because I go to all these conferences, you know, commercial conferences, and every one thing that I see that is common across board is that they have a foundation, and the job of the foundation is not as much about. Uh, okay, sorry, I think I should paraphrase. The job of the foundation is basically to bring all the stakeholders together. For number one is so that they work together. Uh, when you went open source, whether it's desktop or what, you have to take care of certain C's. One is communicate with each other. Yeah. Second is collaborate with each other. Third is contribute to each other's pro project. Yeah. And the last one is compromise. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problem that I've seen, you know, the reason why today we have elementary OS or we had Unity was that two communities failed to make compromises. Yeah. No, I want that. So I'll take the code, I'll fork it, I'll take 10 users with me, but 10 users will pay my bills, so I don't really care about all the rest of the users, and I'm fine. That's why, no offenses to either elementary or a pop out, but that is what is happening. Everybody uh, gets their 10,000 users who pay their bills, and then they don't care about the rest right. of the, you know, it, 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 that's why, that's when you mentioned, you know, there are thousands of Linux distribution. This is the reason, because we fail to compromise. Right. So, so I was taking down some points, you know, and I think you have hit the nail. That's exactly what we need, you know, standard. I will simplify it in a way that we need a foundation, desktop Linux foundation. Please leave the Linux foundation alone. They yeah. are a yeah. trade body. Please they don't are. touch them. We need a desktop Linux, found, you know, desktop Linux foundation. Right. And the j core job is, number one, to, to become an umbrella organization where all these communities, whether it's GNOME, whether it's uh, a KD community, whether it's you know, XFC community or whatever communities are there, they come together. And, uh, okay, I'll give you an example of OpenStack, okay? I, I cover OpenStack, I'll be going to Vancouver. Uh, the OpenStack, you know, they have different distribution. Red Hat has their own distribution. SUSE has their own. Mirantis has their own. Canonical has their own distribution. They all offer their own solutions OpenStack is open source, but right. they take the OpenStack core without forking it, yeah. and then they do some add-ons to cater to their own users. Right. But the base is same. They are contributing to the same code base, so that is why it's growing. Right. So similarly, what we need is to bring all these people together and tell them very clearly that, okay, of course, we have the kernel is the same. Let's share as many components as we can, okay? Okay, GNOME has GTK, GTK KD uh, does with their own, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, I'm just, uh, QT, QT or whatever they call it. And uh, others may, they actually, others actually use mix and uh, of different components, whether you're going to XFC or Mate or whatever, they all use either some of GNOME right. components or some. So what we do is, okay, we keep these technology, you know, stacks together. We have seen with lab stack, you know, you can build the whole stack, you know, you don't have to, you know, compete with each other. You can, so, so, so first of all, find common goals, you know, that, okay, these are the things. Okay, so you have the kernel, uh, Linux kernel base, which is totally stable. Then we have, you know, your own desktop environment, which offers an interface for users and peoples and applications to use the platform. And, but then you have a lot of other things also, like, for example, you have to handle audio, you have to handle video, you have to handle graphic cards, you have right. to handle, you know, networking. So these are the things that do not actually uh, interfere with the user experience. Right. Why to do that? Like OpenStack does not have 10 different networking stacks, you know, they have just one. Right. You add value on top of that. So com let's, let's work on one flat networking stack, one flat, you know, audio visual stack, you know, one flat, you know, the server, 
Right. Please end the fight about VLAN and all those nonsense there. Right. Now, on top of that, you offer your own interface, you know, because you believe in, okay, the, 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 the unit, uh, GNOME shell is the kind of inter interface you like, fine. Uh, KD people like Plasma, fine. Do that, no problem. So first of all, anything that goes below that, work together on it. No more force, you know, right. no more, they all use the same. Now, once you have the shell on top of that, you say that, you know what, uh, LibreOffice or whatever, once again, please use one. Right. One LibreOffice right. across the board. Right. One app manager or one app store. I really hate the way, forget about desktops, uh, dis uh, distribution desktop environments have their own app managers. Yeah. You know, uh, KD has discovery or discover and uh, uh, GNOME just come out with software and every distribution has their own app manager. Yeah. Why? Right. Please, just, just one flat app manager. I, by flat, I don't mean flat pack. I just mean you know, one flat app manager for everything that right. you're doing. And then on top of that, please settle down with one. What's the harm? Just settle down right. with worm app distribution right. and development platform it could be a flat pack it could be app image whatever you know that's why compromise right. you know you are not uh, uh, in a mission critical environment that you are not shooting missiles in the uh, uh, on the world that you think that oh your solution is better than their solution right. so i cannot make a compromise please right. make compromise right and then on top of that when you do all of that then please 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 become rolling release yeah. okay yeah. use Use uh, once you start using Flatpak, then you don't have to have maintainers. What I hate even more is that for the same application for LibreOffice, OpenSUSE will have a maintainer for version X and then version Y and then version Z. Right, right. Fedora will have one maintainer. Uh, Arch Linux will have one maintainer. Ubuntu. So you are wasting resources of ten people doing the same thing. Right, right. Just imagine. If those 10 people are working on one app, yeah. how amazing that will be. Exactly. And then, you, as you explained that, you know, on the same distribution, different desktop environments have different version of the apps because right. you know, that four different app maintainers and one is active, one is not that active, one has some problem at home, so they didn't do it. Right. So you are wasting the sources and right. you are creating a, a very bad experience for users. If you do all of that, then what will happen is that Desktop Linux will become a unified platform, one platform. So there will be just three platforms, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. Right. And, and, and then you won't, yes. And this, this, this board could make this really easy. It doesn't have yes. to be hard. What they would do no. is you release a poll, and you release this poll wide, globally. What is your, um, you know, a, not a multiple choice, but you know, pick one. What is your uh, office suite of choice? What is your desktop of choice? What is your email client of choice? What is your audio player of choice? What is your video player of choice? And you just go down the list and then you send it out and then you get the results, okay? And the, uh, but and, how, do and, you, how do you know that, uh, how, first of all, that, uh, what kind of, like, okay, I don't want to kind of, you know, uh, uh, bus killer, but, uh, Let's say a lot of people, they use desktop Linux for really serious work, like you and me, you know. We use our machines for a lot of serious work. And then there may be a lot of users, uh, no offenses to anybody whatsoever. Uh, they they dual boot with Linux and they come onto Linux world just to play for a while and, you know, they go back and do that. They don't, uh, a platform is not, you know, a right. uh, 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 you know, or die situation. Right. But most of the people like you and me, we are actually not on those forums or polls. Right. But, so but what, how do you make sure that the feedback you're getting is a, of the quality or the actual users that matter? Right. Well, here, here's the thing. All, all I'm saying is this would be used for when they get the numbers back, this, this governing organization would say, okay, LibreOffice got the most votes for Office Suite of Choice. That's going to be our default. Let's say GNOME got the most votes for Desktop of Choice. That's going to be the desktop that we promote. And you just go down the line. And it's just, what I'm saying is, it, it takes away the guesswork and, and, and the, 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 cho the kind of choosing favorites and all that. All it does is it, it, it paints a picture by numbers of what people want the most for their defaults. And then right. after that, once those, once those numbers are crunched, they, they decide on their defaults. They say, this is 
the, le the Linux desktop standards to go by. You know, and maybe GNOME software is this, or, or maybe Synaptic winds up being the package manager of choice. It right. doesn't, what all I'm saying is, is that this would give them a skeleton of what to use to say, okay, from this, we're going to build the standards by which that we can all develop a desktop distribution, regardless of the underlying platform, regardless of whether it's Debian based or Red Hat based or, or, or um, FreeBSD based or whatever your base is. It, can, it doesn't matter. As long as mm -hmm. on the desktop, it adheres to these standards. Then we could okay, say yeah, this, yeah. these yeah. desktops are then certified okay for the average user to use without problem. Uh, I have uh, I have uh, uh, even a crazier idea, and the idea is that uh, I know there will always be people. There are always people who do not like GNOME, you know, right. or who uh, don't like Plasma. So I would actually what I would say is that uh, when you when you talk about okay the unified Linux platform, let's say that there is one layer which is flexible, only one layer that is the desktop environment. Sure. You, okay. The, you come to the, our platform, we have a unified platform, you can download, you know, uh, Linux from here, and there are four options. Yeah. You can have no, sure. you can have Plasma, you can have XFC, you can have Mate, you can have blah, 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 right, blah. Right. doesn't matter, okay? You have these four options, but what happens is irrespective of whichever version you offer, oh, sorry, get, besides the, 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 the user interface that you get, Everything is same. Yeah, right, right, right. You get the same app manager. You get the same version of application. You get the same stack of networking. So, because I do know there will always be tribalism sure. between this desktop community, so they will never agree. Sure. But what I'm saying is that okay, let's do that. But why to waste resource on anything which is above and below that? Right. Because it really doesn't really matter. KDE is uh, a networking manager or gnomes. All I am doing is accessing my damn router so I can get connected right, simple. Right, right. And, and I think that's a great idea. I, th I think that's a great idea. And it, it, would, it would offer the users the variety that they're expected. But even among that variety, there would be standards that, those, that each desktop would follow so that if a user downloads and installs the GNOME version, they're getting the same experience with the exception yes, of the user matter. interface. Doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, so they know that the, the LibreOffice is going to be the same. They know that it's going to have the same default uh, audio player. It's going to have the same default vi image editor. It's going to, you know, it's it's not it's not that hard. It really is. Actually, and, actually, the funny thing is that it uh, it actually reminds me of Android. If you look at if you buy a phone from Samsung or Motorola or LG or Sony, right. okay. You do get their own customized, you know, whatever they slap on it, but you buy everything from Google App Store. Right, the right. audio, the camera, the right. everything works the same. So right. every, everything above and below, okay, there is a UI difference, but that is the decision you have consciously made because you like, you like XFC right. over KDE or, you know, right. uh, no. And, and, and the Linux app stores are no different than Google Play Store. The difference no, is, no. is they just all have different inter, kind of different interfaces. So why not just unify it, make it easy so that anybody on any Linux distribution would know exactly what they're doing and there wouldn't be this hurdle barrier to entry or alert, any sort of learning curve would be stripped away. Yes, and it, it, it will actually, the benefit will go beyond users. What will happen is when you have just three platforms, Mac right. OS, Linux and Windows, then what will happen is and, and, and then you have the whole networking stack, you have the whole right. graphical stack, you have the whole audio stack standardized. Then, okay, I don't know what people think or not think, but then it will be much easier for Adobe to target Linux as one platform. Right. They right. don't have to deal with right, Fedora exactly. and OpenSUSE. Yeah. Uh, to, to, like, for example, uh, when it comes to video editing, I use, you know, uh, Mac, I prefer Mac or Windows. But for the, for the, for the GTX you know, 1070 uh, Ti driver that I have, I need CUDA drivers. If I don't use the CUDA driver, first of all, I cannot apply any effect, you know. Right. Uh, you know uh, and the, because when I shoot in 4K, the image will not even move forward. And when I render it, it will take, once I disable CUDA for our video, it was telling me 18 hours to render that video without CUDA. Yeah. When I enabled the CUDA, it was two hours. Right. Okay. So I so people don't understand these things, but it does matter. So yeah. what will happen is it will be easier for companies like Apple 
Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, even Apple can bring iMusic or whatever there. Sure. Uh, uh, that was just, you know, a slip of the tongue. I didn't right. mean Apple. I meant for Adobe or, or any other company, it will be easier because then they know that they are targeting as one platform. Right. The if, even bigger thing that is going to happen is with the, with the, with the as we are talking in the beginning, filmmaker and all those things, then suddenly they will have access to a platform right. where since it's open source, they can just hop onto the kernel mailing list. Maybe once they get beaten by Linux, if they are really senior maintainer, but they can actually optimize their applications for the machine. You're right. That is not possible with anywhere else. Right. Because you don't have access to the kernel level code and Windows is not going to implement your changes every now and then. Here you can do it. So that will affect the users because suddenly you have uh, you know, you have the same experience that Mac OS and Windows users get, you know, very smooth, very buttery smooth experience. Uh, app developers, they're happy because, you know, they have to write app once and they know everybody is using the same version across the platform. Right. Right. It will be very easy for, for the Linux communities because now you have more happy users, yeah. not gruntly users who are like complaining about it. Right. <coughs> you have a very healthy hardware ecosystem because companies can add support for Linux, like my drone or my 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 camera doesn't sub offer any support for Linux desktop, hardware vendors will be happy. Commercial app developers will be happy. Right. Yeah, I mean, this, this avoids one of the biggest problems that has kept so many different app developers from porting their apps to Linux. It's one of the reasons why yes. there's never been a Photoshop for Linux, because if, yes. if, if they were, if they were uh, tasked to port Photoshop to mm -hmm. Linux, then all of a sudden they'd be like, okay, uh, are we porting it to Wayland? Are we porting it to X.org? Are we porting it to GTK? Are we porting, reporting it to, to QD? Or where, what are we doing? There's, there's way too much. You limit that yes. scope, and then all of a sudden Adobe can go, oh, okay, we can port Photoshop to Linux now. Right, right. And one more thing is that uh, when you mentioned earlier, you know, the return on investment are not that high you know, to, to, to uh, handle all the mess of supporting all these you know, different uh, QT and you know GTK whatever it is. Right. One more thing that will happen is that uh, the user base will grow beyond what we have right now. Right. Because you see, the moment you mention Adobe Photoshop, ten very loud and vocal Linux users say, "We don't want any Adobe crap on our <laughs> systems." <laughs> okay, you don't want it, don't use it. Yep. You know. Exactly. But you know, so another reason why a lot of companies don't support desktop Linux is, is there is so much hostility and toxic environment that the moment you mention, I mean, you are coming, hey, you know what, we want to bring this application and then 20 people will say, we don't want your crap, please, you know, don't pollute our Linux world, it's right. pure, right. pristine. So, so because, you know, they are, uh, when you start supporting a lot of, you know, more people will come and join the, right. the, the community, more tolerant people, and then it's fine. Right. It's okay. Right. Yeah, stop being selfish with this wonderful open source platform and allow yes. allow new users in. Right, it should be a platform. The goal of uh, a Linux desktop should be a platform. You know, yeah. its its goal is to uh, the the primary goal of any platform is to be able to run like a car. You know, you are a car. You are building a car so that people can. You don't get to decide that. Oh, you know what? We will let only people with this surname run, uh, or the people who are not member of NRA, or people who are not voting right. for XYZ. If you're doing that, we will not. Actually, right now, that's what Linux desktop is. That, oh, we only support free and open source. Right. Okay, we understand that the goal, primary goal, actually, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm a huge supporter of open source, but I'm also realistic. Right. The, 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 point, the discussion I was having with the KD community last week when I was talking to Lydia, and I was like, it doesn't matter that, you know, you, you talk about free software and open source, but if only 10 people out of 1,000 people use it, what is the point of that right. platform? Right. If nobody's using it, it's useless. Right. So the goal is that more and more people use it so that they not only get benefit from it, but they also kind of, the, the whole point of a safer word is more well-educated people around you, right? right. Uh, like where I am living, you know, if they're like poor people who cannot uh, even get, you know, next day's meal, their only way is some kind of violence to get some money, to steal some money, you know, or hurt somebody to get that money, right? right. That's how it works. So, so even if you have two rich people in a neighborhood, everybody else is poor, what's the point? Right. Same is with the open source, you know, if there are only two people using in open source in the world, what is the point? Because right. everybody else is compromised. Right. It could be the absolute most perfect platform on the planet. 
If a hundred people it, are it, using it, 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 it will doesn't be. matter. It will be. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, we have all the recipes that will make Linux successful. I mean, beyond success, the only thing is how to bring the Linux community under the same roof and tell them that the one C that matters the most is compromise. Yeah. So somebody out there, I don't know who it's going to be. Somebody needs to start this Linux desktop uh, standards group. Somebody does. And, and it needs to be a genuine movement. And people need to, like you said, people need to learn how to compromise. Otherwise, nothing will get done. Nothing. We will just keep doing what we have been doing for the last 27 years. Yeah. And, and, and we will still be anybody doing. that's used Linux, when you use it enough, you, you, the, in the, always in the back of your mind, you think, why is this not more popular? I mean, I don't want to say that, but I mean, I, I do use Mac OS for my work because I need it, but I feel uh, uh, an anger within uh, somewhere deep down because I do know yeah. that I, I, I should be running Linux because everything is doable. Yeah. It's just because our community is not willing to do those things. I am forced to use Mac OS. So uh, please, all the community members and all the haters out there, when I use Mac, don't, don't, don't come back and tell me that you are using Mac. You should go back and ask those community that they failed me. Right. Right. They you know? failed me. That's why I'm using it. Yeah. If they, if they did not screw it up or if they just listen to what we are saying, everybody will be using Linux. Everybody. Right. And when I say everybody, I mean Facebook like everybody. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I'm open about this. I, I eventually had to adopt using Mac OS for one task, and that was video editing. And I That's used, the same case here. I tried. I used OpenShot since, ver since its early versions, and I, I tried so hard to make it work. And it worked okay for very, very, very basic video editing. And it's, it was great to use. It was very easy to use. Right. But then when they moved to the new version, things started breaking. And then things recall, just stopped yeah, working. Yeah. And I recall early days when I was using uh, KDN Live and OpenShot. Yeah. Only thing I was doing was I was recording des my record my desktop to record a screen sh you know a screencast, and even then it will crash. Yeah. And just yeah. imagine our previous video where we uh, I kind of you know uh, marked your footage with mine. It's not possible at all. No. L right no. now we are recording audio on four different tracks. Yeah. I have to sync all, we are recording video on three different tracks. Yeah. We, we have to sync everything, you know, it right. is not possible. So yeah. you need it, but it can be done on Linux. Yes, it can. It just can. listen to what Jack is saying. Just listen to what we are saying. It can be done. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you, you come to some sort of standards, then, then maybe, just maybe, one of the powerhouse tools like Final Cut Pro or, or Adobe Premiere could get ported to Linux. And then all of a sudden, you can do everything you need to do on Linux and not have to, not have to settle for tools that only work halfway. I, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's not about maybe, to be honest. It will come. It will. Yeah, it will. And, and again, I'm saying I use, I use Mac for one, well, for two things now, because I, I discovered that my new editor for my books, she doesn't use track changes. Yeah. She uses comments. So I'll open, I tried opening one of her, uh, one of her edited copy manuscripts. And it had hundreds and hundreds of comments, and LibreOffice came to a crash. I read the story that you wrote also. And it was, it was frustrating. And, and, and I even reached out to the LibreOffice community, and their answer was to up the, up the uh, cache memory in LibreOffice. Well, that didn't work. It worked yeah. partially. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was still, you know, when I opened that same document in, Adobe, in Apple Pages, it scrolled smoothly, and I could just work and blah, blah, blah. When I went to LibreOffice, I would scroll and wait, scroll and wait. And when you're working with a, a full length novel, that scroll and wait, scroll and wait doesn't fly. Because mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. have to be able yeah. to work with a modicum of efficiency. Now, everything else I do, yeah. I do on Linux. Right. But there is a risk. The yeah. risk is that your two of your major workloads have moved to Mac. Yeah. You are a professional writer. You don't have the luxury to waste time, you know, right. Uh, right. in getting, and you know, you can, uh, so the thing is two of your workloads have moved to Mac OS 
And then there is a possibility that some other workload, you will realize, oh, you know what? It works better on Mac than right. on Linux. Right. That will move to Linux. I have seen a lot of friends initially who I converted to Linux. They have gone back to their original platform right. because there was that one thing and then two things and then three things. And suddenly they were like, you know what? This is a better workflow. Just stick here. Why to just switch between that? So, I mean, there is a big risk, you know, that, you know, that people as they uh, move their workload into some kind of speed. Though, I know a lot of people, they, they can do everything in Linux as they want, but, you know, you know G.R.R. Martin also writes a novel, and then some other crappy writer also writes a novel. So, you cannot compare that, you know, just because you are doing something differently, doesn't mean that, that right. it could be right for you. Right. But that doesn't mean that is a right for everything. Right, right. So one more thing is that, you know, never tell that, you know, oh, I use Photoshop. Oh, sorry, I do GIMP and I'm happy. Yeah, you can be happy. It's yeah. fine. Right. We all are happy. You married someone else. I married someone else, you know, so it's okay. Right. You drink Coke, I drink juice. It's fine. Oh, right. Mostly I drink beer, but I don't drink actually. <laughs> and I don't drink I'm, Coke either. <laughs> I haven't yeah, had caffeine I I, in six months. <laughs> and lately, yeah, if I, lately, it's been really hard to wake up. <laughs> I cannot drink Coke. It upsets my stomach, and I yeah. just uh, I am happy with the with beer. And after yeah. living in Europe, I kind of sometimes I start drinking in the, during the lunch hours. <laughs> so yeah, so let's let's just reach out to you, audience. What do you think? What what could become of a of a Linux desktop standard? Could it work? Are we off our, are we off our rockers here? Or, or are we on to something that maybe the Linux community needs to seriously think about? Maybe? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the whole point of this video uh, or this discussion, that this show that we have started, is, though it, it, the name is Let's Get Serious, we actually, we are not that serious, but the things that we are concerned about, those are some really serious concerns uh, and we need to fix them. So when we say let's get serious, it's just, we are not like sitting with our grumpy faces there. And we yeah. we have both been part of. I mean, we are still you know part of the. I wouldn't even say it's still part of you know because uh, I, I, the KD committee on G Google Plus. I started that, so I have been a very active Linux user. So I am as passionate, and I can get as angry as you can be as a Linux user. And I have been doing Linux for much longer, and I think yeah. we have con uh, converted a lot many users to Linux than some of you guys may have. So please don't you don't get offended and don't go, come back with any nasty comment. As last time also Jack said that we will ignore them or we'll remove them because it's about the way we think about it as if you are sitting in my couch and having a discussion. So just think right. about what kind of words and what kind of language you would use if you are actually sitting next to me on a couch and talking to us. So just yeah. be civil, be nice. Let's right. have a very serious discussion about Linux this time. And uh, uh, what are we going to talk next time? Gosh, I don't know. Maybe we need to take a break from Linux. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Or maybe we don't. We'll see how it goes. Um, we have so many things to talk about. Uh, we, we could talk about um, science fiction. We can talk about the state of, you know, the, the, the state of, of, of modern science fiction movies or, or books. Or we could talk about anything. Talk about video editing. We could talk about technology and cameras and all sorts of things. Audio. What do you guys want to hear about, audience? What would you like us to talk about? Yes, share your thoughts in the comments below, and we'll see you next time. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us um, and supporting Linux and us. Thank you so much. <laughs>